Welcome back to the Honeycomb Hideout. I'm your host, your Scent Master Thirst King, Joe Kane. With me, as always, is my collaborator, co pilot, co conspirator, Christine Kitchens, the Scientist Supreme. I gotta say, right now, um, I close my eyes and visions of corn fields are dancing through my head. It's real bad, y'all. Real bad. Corn fields. Form fields. Like a computer form that you fill out. You want to hold computer out a Google Docs thing? That, huh. That what's happening? No, Interesting. No, no, no. I'm making like a, it's a, it's a button. It's uh it seems so simplistic, but it's like, you know how you have like text editors and they'll mm-hmm. have a button that's like add a hyperlink. Mm-hmm. I'm currently trying to make that button happen mm. for my work project and it's the devil. Mm. Fun shit. <laughs> so that that's always a fun point to reach with a job where you are seeing it in your in your in your daydreaming mind, and it is yeah, that is disheartening. But of course, and y'all have already heard, we have a guest in the hideout with us today. So, and I've forgotten already. Honestly, what did did we come up with a name? I don't know if we got for, a name for Bodie. I'm 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 Brody. I'm here to talk about stories. <laughs> um, I, Mr. Mumbles, I think is clearly oh, yeah. a name that I go by in all radio related capacities. So, hello, everybody. Honestly, I can't argue with Mr. Mumbles. Mr. Mumbles is good. It is I, universally recognized by people who know Brody. I, I come by it honestly. <laughs> mm. now, those are always the best names, honestly. Yeah. yeah. So. Based off of that, so yeah, we have Mr. Mumbles in the hideout with us today, and we are going to be talking, well, since the last episode, we went so hardcore in the, on the analysis of a particular form of media, we figured, let's broaden our horizons a little bit by actually discussing an entire form of media itself. Um, yeah, no, we do not go lightly on the Honeycomb hideout, but... Before we dive into that, there's some news, y'all, that I didn't get to talk about last time. And motherfucker, we, I'm going to talk about it now. I was like, damn, Joe, you like me, like blowing out the <laughs> mic over there right now. <laughs> little bit, little bit. but um, how excited you are to talk yes. about oh, your absolutely. superhero homies. Oh, absolutely. fucking lutely Because this there's some shit that I've been waiting on years to finally happen. Now, of course, we have the whole... Uh, we talked about the Jonathan Majors thing already, so Kang is probably going to be decentralized in a lot of the storytelling moving forward. So that's really not even news. The recent rumor mill, though, is that he might have a replacement for Kang coming up soon. And the current primary frontrunner is Coleman Domingo. Which one is that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Remember Candyman, the new one. Yes. Remember the remember, remember the um the kid that survived and turned our the main character into the next Candyman? Yes. He ran the laundromat. Yes. Yes, it's yes, it's all coming back to me now. Yes. Him. Oh, I see. I and see. I've actually seen him in quite a few other projects. He's good. And the funny thing is it turns out he actually auditioned for Kang originally. Really? Before okay. before uh, Jonathan Majors got it, nice. so um, I'm really I'm feeling good about the fact that like you know, there's a strong possibility he might he might be the one to get it, especially with that sort of news coming up. And honestly, I actually like the character of Kang, despite the fact that time travel actually irks me. <laughs> I actually love the character of Kang, so I really really want to see that story continue at least to some degree. So I'm really hoping that that pans out. Now, the news that I really, really want to talk about is going to be after this next bit. Um, But first and foremost, Deadpool 3 is finally coming out this year. Nice. Finally got a trailer for the Super Bowl during the Super Bowl. And they're straight up buddy copping it because it's not just Deadpool 3. It's Deadpool and Wolverine. And... Man, oh man! They mentioned pegging in the trailer, oh, in the same sentence as Disney. Pretty sure they mentioned pegging in the Twitter post when they were first like, "Oh, easy." You remember when that came out like a million years ago? And yeah. they were like, "Hey, 
we're getting back together, reunited, and it feels so good. Some <laughs> bullshit like that. That sounds like Yeah, good. indeed. And honestly, the movie looks really fucking good, and there is definitely a lot of opportunities for A, story setup, B, a, a whole different tone for the MCU in general, and C, Deadpool and Wolverine in a movie together. I mean, damn. I mean, even when the first one came out, it was always going to be sketchy if that was ever going to happen. But now it actually is. So that's honestly pretty fucking dope. But the real exciting news, and yes, I may be the only person, at least in, th- in this podcast room, that's excited about this, but I don't give a fuck. The Fantastic Force cast has finally been announced. Yeah, you are, in fact, the only round, person excited round, about round that. Four? Is that what we're on for? Fantastic <laughs> Four movies at this point? Uh, actually, the first one technically was never released. Okay. So, no, we're, so we're only on round three. Gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> okay. I believe this is this is third time's the charm. They're going to yeah. they're gonna pull it off this time. Oh, so yeah. for that first one, was it kind of like, uh, shit, what, what is it that people were obsessed with? Uh, is it like the Snyder Cut? Is this like a uh, Snyder uh, Cut situation? No, actually, where people not, are... not quite. Um, the funny <laughs> thing is, it's actually a Roger Corman production, if you can believe it. Mm-hmm. Um, the studio, actually, the not, not Roger Corman's studio, but um, the, this big executive bought the rights to the Fantastic Four, and they were trying to hold on to it because they knew that they were gonna just there. It was gonna be a big deal at some point, but it took them so long to try to pull something together that the rights were about to expire. So literally they threw together a cast, a script and a so and such and such within a really short bit of time to make sure they could film the movie in just just enough in just enough time to keep the rights. And they had they, they lied to the cast, they lied to most of the crew. It was a passion project though it really does look like a fucking fan film. <laughs> and Honestly, I fucking loved it as a kid <laughs> because you could find, you, though they never released it, it was a staple at every comic convention for like most of the 90s. Gotcha. And it was just like, it's kind of like that 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 secret that everyone knows, basically. <laughs> um, it's it's kind of it's kind of hilarious like that, but. Um, but yeah, the, the Fantastic Four is unfortunately just one of those Marvel properties that could never quite catch a break. I mean, the first major one got a got a sequel, did just well enough under Fox, but the fact of the matter is, though, they just they couldn't they they just didn't catch on like the X Men did, and sure as hell weren't going to catch on like the Avengers did. Uh, so, so I haven't seen the casting. Are they keeping mm. um, John Krasinski as uh, Mr. Fantastic, or is this a, a no, whole? This is a that's whole a, new. That's a ca- bummer. That he was excellent, but that's fine. <laughs> But here's but the funny the funniest thing in the world is how they announced it. Okay, they announced it with official artwork released on Valentine's Day. It was literally a Happy Valentine's Day post with artistic renderings of each of the actors. So, for Reed Richards, they've got Pedro Pascal. Okay. 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 Yes. Cool. Uh, ben, uh, for Sue Storm, Vanessa Kirby. Um, you might know her from the uh, Mission Impossible films, or if you'd seen uh, Fast and Furious, Hobbs and Shaw. Um, uh, Shaw's sister, she she played in that. She's been in a lot of different stuff, but um, those are the most prominent things you might have seen her in. Um, Johnny Storm, her brother, played by Joseph Quinn. Um, Eddie from the latest season of Stranger Things. Mm. Okay. Yep. Yep, he's also going to be in the Quiet Place prequel. Wait. Yeah. Like. Oh uh, yeah, a Quiet Place Day One. Oh, is that the fucking um horror movie? Is is that a thing? Uh, that that's a yes. horror movie. Oh yeah, I was like, I think I've yeah. seen that one. They had a sequel that came out that like, was, last that year. That was or also the one with John Cusack. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. I, I got. Yeah. It. I think it's actually a pretty decent movie. I remember it, it actually, the first it actually it actually is pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I'm into that. I'm into that. See, um, my ears are already perking up a little bit more just from this news. <laughs> it's probably and, the monster. <laughs> but also, but the the but Ben Grimm, the one I'm actually really excited about, is uh, 
Eben Moss. Oh, motherfucker, I'm going to fuck up his name. I know I'm going to fuck up his name. Uh, I believe it's Eben Moss Backrack. Uh, now, he's been all over the place. He's been in a bunch of stuff. He was in the Punisher Netflix series as his um, um, sidekick microchip. He's in the, he, he most recently really shot to prominence under the bear. Um, he plays like a character uh, name, his nickname Cousin. I, I haven't seen the bear, so unfortunately, um, I've heard great things about it, but just have not been able to add it to my queue. But he's, oh, he was also an Andor. Did you ever see and you Yes. He wow. Was. Yep. Wow. Wow. You look so disappointed at me. Right now. <laughs> Am I wrong in thinking that she would enjoy Andor, I, Brody? I, th I think you would. It was a really interesting take for a Star Wars show because um instead of indulging in the high fantasy of the setting with a lot of Jedi and stuff, it um it was the first Star Wars thing that I I, I think could have been a story set anywhere anytime and was still really well done yes. it was basically about resistance fighters doing the resistance fighter thing yep. which is something that i think you would enjoy yeah. um but also was it, it was made a little bit better by mm -hmm. by being a star wars show yes um but it was also a, a good show taking away the trappings of 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 star wars as a thing mm -hmm. so it was it was solid yeah. it was basically sci-fi revolution yeah yeah so yeah, that, that I, that's why I'm really genuinely surprised you had not watched it. I mean, it's not Big Mouth for the 18th time, so okay. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, hey, you brought him. Okay, so <laughs> I'm feeling like this might potentially be a good segue into uh, the bigger topic here, mm -hmm. relating to the fact that there are certain genres. I don't want to say I don't give a fuck about them, <laughs> but I will not like. I'm like I don't even know what to call this. It's like there are certain things that are of the genre that if I walk into the room while mm. they're playing and I watch them for 15 seconds, mm. I might sit down and continue watching them, mm. but I will never watch them beyond that. Mm. And uh, honestly, I feel like a lot of pure sci-fi stuff, a lot of mm. pure superhero stuff mm. is just the kind of thing that I do not personally go out of my way to go and watch. Mm. It's something that usually I go because somebody has asked me to go along. Mm. <clears throat> Joe. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, and so, <laughs> but obviously we're sitting here and you're talking about mm -hmm. these superhero or flicks and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and you are getting like super hype and super nerded out, and I'm oh, sitting yeah. here and I'm like waiting for the monster to hit. <laughs> and... <laughs> This is what we were kind of talking about for mm -hmm. today's big topic, right? Is the oh, fact absolutely. that there are all of these different genres of visual media. Mm -hmm. um, the fiction in general. Yeah. Fiction in general, yeah. yeah. Sci-fi, horror, superhero movies, action, mm -hmm. romance, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And there are some something about these topics, you know, people want to glom onto for mm -hmm. inexplicable reasons. Oh, yeah. Like, the, the, like... I think we're we're here to kind of try and parse part the reasons why, you know, someone like me mm. might only want to sit down and watch basically 24 hours straight of horror movies <laughs> <laughs> and wouldn't, has no interest in the world about watching another Marvel movie if I could possibly get away with it. Um, but then it's like there's so, you know, somebody like you who mm. fucking loves the, the superhero movies, loves, mm -hmm. you know, Spider-Man, loves Power Rangers, loves all that kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah, and then it's like we got Brody over here, who I feel like you are more of a sci-fi person, if anything. Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty fair. Mm -hmm. um, sci-fi fantasy. Um, but I'm also, like, I, I really, really appreciate mm. well-crafted, like, comedy movies. That's the oh, thing that yeah. I feel like we don't have anywhere near enough of. Um, mm -hmm. But the idea of taking a conventional plot and inserting as much ridiculousness as possible is mm. also something that's very appealing to me, and I will catch when it comes <laughs> out. Mm. Okay. Uh, I can definitely uh, understand where you're coming from there, because there is something about taking convention and highlighting the ridiculousness that can either come from it or be injected into it. I, I mean, I, I can totally re resonate with that because I love that shit too. But, um, but yeah, like, I mean, going to the topic at hand. Yeah. There, it, for, it's a, 
it's a funny, it's an interesting way of highlighting the differences inherent in people themselves. There is, you can take something down to the scientific level, down to a person's age, dem- demographic, um, region, you know, orientation. All the, you can nail down all these aspects of a thing and then say, this person is bound to love this thing and that person will throw it in the trash. There is no definable way to confirm how much certain types of people are going to love any type of thing. And that is fascinating as fuck to me. I like how you say it's not definable, but that's clearly what we're about to try to do here. All right. Well, we're going to we're going to parse it out, but there is no way in hell it's going to fit in any box we try to put it in. Let us be let us be real with expectations. And and <laughs> and on the other side of that, one of my favorite parts about people and people liking things is that people are actually incredibly bad at knowing what kinds of things they will actually like themselves. Yes. The sorts of experience they will enjoy. Mm-hmm. Y- you can sit through a movie mm-hmm. and know on the other end what you liked that that you liked it or that you didn't. Mm-hmm. What you probably will not do unless you put a lot of thought time in and a lot of comparison mm-hmm. is know why you liked it or didn't mm-hmm. like it. If you didn't like it, you're not going to watch it three more times to figure out what rubbed you the wrong way for the most part. <laughs> Unless you are just that specific type of person that needs to know that. Yeah, answer. absolutely. Unless unless you're you're going into it for an uh, um and like you said, an analytical experience mm-hmm. instead of a um a, a emotional or an enjoyment experience. Yeah. Um, the the idea of reengaging with something that rubbed you the wrong way is mm-hmm. just kind of outside of the experience that most people are willing to engage with. Yep, there's a reason why I've only seen Joker once. Actually, I can name five, but we're, that's not the topic of today. I, I, haven't, I haven't even seen it once, I'll be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. Okay, all right, okay. But let's do this. Let's, do, okay. let's, let's, be, okay. let's be systematic and smart about this. Uh, okay. okay. So, okay. Let's do some science. All right, let's science. Do some science let's do here. It. All right. Uh, if there was something like hmm. a video component to go with this, <laughs> this is the part where I would expect a uh, list to show up on the screen that lists out the uh, different genres we're going to try and touch on here. <laughs> so we have like, okay. So I'm going to say we have action flicks, which I'm going to roll superheroes into. Honestly, superhero is a flavoring. They are primarily action dramas. So we have so, yes. action flicks. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about sci-fi. We oh, yes. We talked about yes. comedy. Mm-hmm. We talked about horror. Mm-hmm. And then I think we have romance there, which I noticed that none of us went for when we were talking about nope. our favorite ones. But we'll, we'll stick it at the bottom <laughs> of the list there so we can... Uh, Chew that over if we have time. Okay. See, okay. In, in, and that's one of those places where, it, like, the, the ideas of genre mm-hmm. really, really bends and blurs at the edges. Because, oh, yeah. like, when I, when I think comedy movie, the, the one that comes to my mind right off the top of my head is um, uh, Cyrano with Steve Martin. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. It's yeah. incredibly well done. He, it, in, instead of the, the classic take on the story, he's mm-hmm. a firefighter. But you, you hit all of the same plot beats. Yep. And ultimately, though, it's a really funny movie, and mm-hmm. I would consider it a comedy. It is legitimately it's a love story all the oh, way oh through. yeah absolutely so it's you're you're you're, you're you're to the point that you like you're you're you're, you're trying to pull these genres apart and look at them mm-hmm. but there is a lot of overlap kind of no mm-hmm. matter where you go or where, where you look at on the circle oh yeah, absolutely you're kind of right there and honestly since you mentioned Cyrano that made me think that I think I do also want to like on a little sticky note tack on like <laughs> drama at the end of uh that okay, list okay okay but um but let's try to the best of our ability mm. to tr- like target this from a purist standpoint, just just for the sake of like being organized here. Sure. So sure. Uh, I believe we had action movies at the top of the list. So uh, mm. okay. Joe, these are your babies. <laughs> so now we're talking about again. We're talking about superhero flicks. We're talking mm. John Wick. We're mm-hmm. talking um, I don't know whatever it's action Ray, bullshit. Ray, 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 Rambo. Or- Oh yeah, uh, that guy. Classic. Yeah, that's a good one. That's there, a good one. Anything with Bruce Willis in the nineties? <laughs> okay, okay. So let's. Mm. So those are some good examples here. So mm-hmm. bottom line is we're talking about movies that a very big component is there's like some very explosive scenes. There's combat. Mm-hmm. There's usually you know a villain that you need to go and punch in the nuts or something like mm-hmm. that. And um, and usually yeah. that the action. And the explosive scenes and the mm-hmm. combat are the major driving force of oh, these yeah. movies. Mm-hmm. So, all right. So, so what's our pitch for oh. what we think is the reason anybody gets engrossed in an action film? Well, I would almost say action movies are probably the easiest one to define because 
most people have a tendency to have very mundane lives. They, you know, go to, they get up, they go to work, they go to school, they just, you know, live their lives, eat their lunch, just they're, they, they have their routines. So action movies that by their core are about routines being disrupted in very, very significant and substantial ways. Now, whether the main character is actually someone heroic and relatable or someone utterly vile yet somehow intriguing, more often than not, there is something that has disrupted that character's core universe, and they are, and they are, we're on the ride with them to see how they either go back to their life as it was or finding something new out of this destructive disruption. So that's actually one of the the thing that I'm going to come back to a bunch of times and is mm. the reason, the, the, the thing that I talked to about Christy when she told me about this, mm. is the idea of, um, so Joseph Campbell, the monomyth, the hero's journey, the oh, idea yeah. of a, a, all stories are a cycle to one mm -hmm. degree or another. Yep. One of the really interesting things when I think about action movies is the idea that these are not people who are really at the beginning of their story. Mm -hmm. They are not people who are coming from no power and moving into power. Mm -hmm. Action movies tend to f feature people who are, already empowered in one way or another mm -hmm. and over the course of the movie they do what they're already good at mm. there may be some personal growth mm -hmm. in how they see the world how they view the world what they personally take ultimately back mm -hmm. to their experience and in, in in their in their normal mm -hmm. um but these are not people who need to go through the steps of except for with the exception of like superhero origin stories mm, is, yeah. is going to be my, my big oh yeah, yeah, the yeah. Side. Mm -hmm. but these are not people who need to go through the experience of gaining power and learning how to use that power in the mm -hmm. first place these are people who are already empowered for one way or another and, mm -hmm. and get to use that and then have to find ways i think really the best action movies are ones where the the, the kind of power that they have mm -hmm. is not a good fit for the situation they mm -hmm. find themselves in mm -hmm. and they have to overcome that kind of challenge mm -hmm. um so i i think the thing that i'm, I'm going to kind of call out mm -hmm. comparing action movies to other kind of movies mm -hmm. is that idea of an an existing empowered main character mm -hmm. rather than one who's starting from nothing and coming into power which is like i said kind of more of the classic monomyth circle mm. okay no oh, that that actually makes total sense like especially like um the the, the empowerment when you mentioned that my immediate thought was taken absolutely that was that was the quickest example i could come up with because you have someone that already lived that life and was trying to stay away from it but they they fucking kidnapped his daughter, so now he's got to brush off all those old skills again. And it wasn't like he just walked through everybody. It was a, it was a task. But, and but yeah, no, the uh, the the fact that he already, the character already was at that place of knowing what it was he needed to do, but just having to actually do it. That makes total sense for action movies. Yep. So I find it. Um. So I do want to like. Try to blend y'all together a little bit. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, this way, so I can do some <laughs> searing eye contact here while I ask this question. Uh, um, so, you talked a little bit about the hero's journey. Yep. Which I think is a very interesting principle to bring up when talking about action movies. So, Joe mentioned that the reason that he thinks that people get drawn into action flicks or is this disruption of the normal. Um, and I'm curious, I guess I'm curious to see if you think there's a way that that could kind of fit into this idea of the hero's journey. Cause you're saying that for the most part, barring superhero origin movies that, um, we're usually in progress here. Mm -hmm. It doesn't feel like it's walking that full journey. You're kind of walking into the midst of something. And I'm wondering I guess I'm wondering where these two ideas might be able to play together, you know? Yeah, so so there is there is the idea of every story follows this circle. Mm -hmm. Um and you can you can do the traditional Joseph Campbell one where the um in, in the monomyth, the, the place where you step out of the world mm -hmm. that you are comfortable in into the, the the new world, more or less, is the it's the, the call. Um mm -hmm. and, and frequently uh movies will also or, or stories will also deal with like a refusal of the call yep. where mm -hmm. first you turn away from whatever weird thing you've seen or whatever it is that, that is, is drawing you out. Yeah. Um, and then it, 
it basically comes back even harder and you have to deal with it ultimately. Um, so I, I, almost all almost all stories, um, especially Hollywood stories, Western stories, mm-hmm. are written to fo- follow that cycle to one degree or another. Um, but there is the idea of following the cycle inside a single story, inside a single movie, and then looking at what those stages of the cycle say about the person. Um, because a, a lot of what the monomyth talks about is it's not just how stories are written. Mm-hmm. It's a guide for how to become a real legitimate adult in society. Mm-hmm. Like th- that's, that's a lot of what Joseph Campbell talked about when yeah. he was, was talking about this is these are stories that show up in time, time and time again, because they are supposed to instruct us how to be better citizens of society. Mm-hmm. And if you follow people who follow this, 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 this kind of cycle of, mm. of, of how it goes, Mm-hmm. Um, you can maybe shortcut some of the difficulties that they had because <laughs> some of these things are inevitable and some of and, and, and ultimately it's it's how you're gonna deal with it. Mm-hmm. So you can have a, a story that follows the cycle mm-hmm. without necessarily having a character who starts as a a a, per, a person who's never gone through any growth before. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well mm-hmm. now now there's something that's sort of like forming in my head here. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned this idea of, you know, this character arc is kind of designed to show how to function in society, mm-hmm. how to be a better adult, you know, something like that. Mm-hmm. And I, I hear that, and I have to smile a little bit to myself, because I think about movies like John Wick, mm-hmm. like Rambo, mm-hmm. where our heroes, in this case, are engaging in activities that I um think, if they were... <laughs> widespread in their implementation in society yeah. could be pretty chaotic because you know if we went around and found every person that we perceived to be a bad guy and like sucker punched him and like you know and like contacted our secret spying and alleys to help mm-hmm. us go and take you know take these take the bad guys out you know <laughs> It's interesting the kind of message that that would be sending in terms of like how to be a better adult in society is to go and you know fight evil. <laughs> so 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 actually I, I I think I think I want to talk about John Wick for a second because it's a really cool example of one of the things I was just talking about. Uh-huh. Um, it's 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 the ultimate refusal of the call. Oh yeah. John Wick is engaged in that parking lot by the the the, the, the shitty little gangsters. Yep. And mm-hmm. instead of dealing with them, instead of dealing with them violently, instead of mm-hmm. taking care of that problem, then mm-hmm. he leaves it alone. And then they come back and they. Burn down his house and they kill his fucking dog. Yeah, and that that is that is the idea of the refusal of the call. That uh-huh. is the idea of the thing that you need to do is going to come back and make you do it eventually. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, John Wick is not saying that every problem can be solved through through violence. Every problem should be solved through violence. Mm-hmm. John Wick is saying that when you have the the power to deal with problems. Mm-hmm. Just deciding that you're not going to deal with them because you don't want to, or mm-hmm. because you you think it 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 makes you a worse person, mm-hmm. is not necessarily going to get you a better result in the end. Um, that is another place where, like I said, mm-hmm. it 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 really bites into a couple of those 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 steps on the on the mono myth. Um, but I think you're right. Like, mm-hmm. not all stories are necessarily going to be. A shining example of how to be a, a person in everyday society, but like John Wick is very much about how to deal with your shit. How to deal with your shit, responsible use of power, mm-hmm. what what your options and responsibilities are when you have power, mm-hmm. um, and and I so I I think there is some definite definite I mean, work there on both sides if that makes sense. It's one of those things where it's like it's not it's not going to the foot is not going to fit completely, but it slides on decent enough. Yeah. And and seeing seeing a movie like John Wick, it, mm-hmm. it it should not be the idea that everyone should grow up to be a super killer assassin and mm-hmm. solve all of their problems with violence. Mm-hmm. It you should take away from that that <laughs> I'm thinking. I'm, I'm gonna get there. I Bro, promise. Like, be cool and beat up guys. Be a not, super. <laughs> not, not not be cool and beat up guys, but 
use the power you have to fight against the evils that are in front of you. Mm-hmm. Because, like, ultimately, some of John Wick's problems were from the fact that he set this guy up in, in the first place. Mm-hmm. Like, he, 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 he did some legitimate evil in the past to, yep. to o- organize this, this crime lord's rise. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, this is him going back and fixing that, even if it's not for necessarily a great reason or not the reason that we would want to see. Does that make sense? Yeah, I feel you, I feel yeah. you. And the funny thing is, the first two John Wick movies actually both start with John refusing the call. Absolutely. Both of them. And both result in him having to deal with it one way or another. Yep. It's kind of, it, and I just was thinking about that when he said, like, wow, okay. <laughs> it, it, if, you, it, if, if you go start l- looking into the, the Joseph Campbell stuff, oh, yeah. it is really easy to see where some of that stuff mm-hmm. hits in a lot of stories. And part of the reason is because it makes really satisfying stories. Mm-hmm. Like, they're, they're beats that when they're hit, resonate with people oh, it's, it's, it's the reason that stories are told that way mm-hmm. i do want to just take a second and, <laughs> and disclaimer that there's a lot of criti- criticism towards joseph campbell towards oh, the anonymous yeah. stuff um yeah. uh he does he he works pretty much exclusively off of western myths mm-hmm. um he cherry picks his sources so that they mm-hmm. fit a little bit better so i'm i don't want to come across saying this is the end all be all of how oh, to yeah. do stories um but it is well recognized mm-hmm. this is a way to tell a satisfying Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, the funny thing is, I actually also have a pretty prime example. Yeah. I'm not sure if you guys have seen it or not, but it's literally one of my favorite movies of all time. It's a movie called Collateral, starring Jamie Foxx and uh, Tom Cruise. Now, the the reason why I bring this up is because it's kind of the epitome of the story cycle, while also absolutely being the kind of thing that an action that action people would definitely glom onto. Though I would say it more falls into the line of a drama with violence. Because the story starts out, Jamie Foxx plays a cab driver okay. who just, you know, he drives cabs at night. He wants to start his own limo company. But, you know, he's, you know, trying to build up. He has to, you know, if you start a business, you need capital. So he's saving up to do that. And um, he encounters some different people throughout the day. And he meets Tom Cruise's character, who basically offers him a lot of money to just drive him around. And he accepts it initially, but it turns out Tom Cruise is a hitman that is basically, you know, got him, tricked him into being his patsy for the evening. And it's just basically like a roller coaster of, had he not done this thing, had he not taken that money, this, this, this entire thing wouldn't have happened. But it's it's just very it's a very interesting story that I found really kind of fits in with uh, what you were saying there, and honestly, it it, it fall it, but it also falls out of you know, what I was saying in that it is a d- significant disruption from uh, the central character's routine mm-hmm. and how they deal with it. Yeah. All right, I have decided that we need to put some guardrails on here because ah, we apparently okay. cannot control ourselves. <laughs> Okay, um, but are, we, are, we, are we moving on to our next genre? We are Is moving that... on to our okay. next genre. That's fine. Right. And not only are we moving on to our next genre, I'm setting a timer. Oh, shit. Okay. That's right. Okay. That's Serious. fine. That's okay. okay. What, are we, what are we doing next? Okay. I think for our next one, let's do that. I'm going to say let's for our next one, let's do sci fi. Like, oh, okay. okay. Yeah, okay. let's do it. Okay. And I'm starting a seven minute timer because okay. we have to get at least. At least through two more, because I think we can all agree that if we don't make it to fucking romance, that we'll survive. Um, yeah, okay, fine. all right, ready, ready? All right, okay. seven minutes starting now. Go. Okay, so the basic pitch of sci-fi is actually very similar to what uh, Joe was saying about action movies, is mm-hmm. they are an opportunity to um, step out of your every day and explore a vast and unknowable world. Mm -hmm. Um, but do so through a different set of eyes and, um, in the, like, while you're doing so, see how the people that you're observing, um, observe and react and overcome to stimuli and Mm -hmm. challenges to ultimately basically better know the, the, the place that they find themselves in. Um, and I actually want to go ahead and, uh, tag on to that. Yeah. Whereas fantasy it's more of a fantastical and uh, imagine 
super fantastical, imagine, imaginative, whimsical uh, air to it. Science fiction more has an air of speculation. Yes. It more takes things within our current world and speculates where it'll be within a certain time frame. And that's where the that's the world that the story takes place in. So those are like kind of the uh, parameters that um, would work within that. Yeah, and, and honestly, one of the things that I would say really defines sci-fi, like when I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of actual science fiction, which I'm, I'm not going to call Star Wars. Star Wars is fantasy. Yes. Um, fantasy is character-driven. Sci-fi is situation and world-driven. Yes, You're almost absolutely. always more interested in the place that you're finding yourself in the world that you're exploring mm -hmm. than necessarily the people who are doing the exploring. Um, Sci-fi is not always driven by a single character's actions. Sometimes there are circumstances outside of that character that are driving the entire plot. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay, so we're thinking like, all right, because I'm trying trying to frame, frame this in a comparative way. So when mm. we were talking about action flicks before, we were oh, saying yeah. that the reason that people tend to be attracted to this mm. is... Um, this idea behind disruption of the normal. Although mm -hmm. I'm gonna, I think we're gonna find that that kind of applies to a lot of movies, which might be why I mean, we that's... watch fucking movies. Yeah. Um, uh, honestly, uh, honestly, <laughs> honestly, that is fiction in general. Yeah, there really. you go. Oh man. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So <laughs> uh, the... uh, so uh, it's, it's um, person uh, is in a place where they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. They find themselves forced or choose to leave the place where they're comfortable. Mm -hmm. In the course of leaving the place where they're comfortable. They become a different person or grow in some way. Mm -hmm. They return to the place where they're comfortable and find it different because they have been changed. That's that's that's, that's the cycle. There we go. Um, mm -hmm. That's the yes. That, that's exactly what it is. So so saying the idea that you know you're 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 in this situation where mm -hmm. you're comfortable and then something changes. This just the kickoff to, yeah, oh, to yeah. any of that that yeah. story. Yeah. Okay. Cycle. So we're, so we're gonna say that's probably gonna be universal for a lot of these different topics we're talking. Oh yeah. About. Absolutely. But um, so action flicks in particular, there's this idea of following the hero's journey mm -hmm. and seeing, you know, how they sometimes grow mm -hmm. and wield their power, um, for the sake of, you know, disrupting. Mm, malignant sources in uh, their life yeah, yeah. um it's not always evil that. sometimes it just sucks sometimes it just sucks <laughs> and but here with sci-fi we're saying that we're we're a little less interested in seeing how evil is combated we're a little less interested in following a hero along mm -hmm. and you know kind of doing a little bit of that self-insertion mm -hmm. here this is more of like a what if scenario yes like you know like the whole idea but i know we specifically said we don't do star wars for this one <laughs> But like Star Wars, uh, Star Wars, what if, right? Mm -hmm. Like this idea of people might be more attracted to the science fiction genre if mm -hmm. there's sort of that speculative nature to what they're mm -hmm. looking for. They're interested in exploring the idea of what if society advanced towards this? What mm -hmm. if we found a planet like this? So on and so forth. Do mm -hmm. we feel like that's kind of fair? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would, I would say so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay. Cool. All right. Yeah. Do we want to keep talking about this, or do we want to uh, roll some timer over? So I, 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 I the, the other thing <laughs> that I will, I will toss about, um, can a, a lot of sci-fi is mm -hmm. that, um, sci-fi is a really interesting place to dig into. Um, it's a question that comes up everywhere, but sci-fi is a really interesting place to dig into, like, like the the, the core of what is human. Mm. Um, oh yeah. Specifically because it gives you the opportunity to show things that are near human but not human mm -hmm. that's robots that's humanoid aliens mm -hmm. um you can make them be different and distinct in one specific way mm -hmm. in 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 doing so very clearly showcase what it means to be human by comparing your mm -hmm. your, your your actual human cast to the, the robots to whatever i really also, like that yeah also to you know tag on to that as well it's the nature of progress not just not whether and whether or not the level of progress that we are actually seeking would actually be good in the long run. So that's another question that comes up. Not just the question of humanity, the question of life, mm -hmm. like whether or not we us doing this or what will happen if this happens. The speculation aspect. Yeah. So yeah, it's it it it, it. Yes, it's it's another one of those places where you get to come out of it and mm -hmm. be like, 
is the future that this sci-fi is depicting for me something that I want to see come true? Mm -hmm. Something that I want to see happen. And then you take that back to your own life and be like, okay, what can I do to either prevent this future that I see depicted for me from coming true or mm -hmm. make it happen if, mm -hmm. if the, the, the idea, if, if, if the sci-fi that it brings forward is a little bit more utopic. Mm -hmm. um, mm. is, is like the, 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 the movie in my mind that is big, strong in that category, something like Elysium. Where oh, you have absolutely. like the like the, oh, this yeah. this is where capitalism goes in the end. Yeah. <laughs> um and and what you should take out of that is not this was a cool story, this was cool speculation. It's mm -hmm. this is how our world's gonna end if I don't do anything about it. And I should probably try to do something about that. This the, 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 the this horror this is horror. This is existential horror. And and like I said, it, this mm -hmm. is another one of those places where you see a lot of blur between genres. Like yes. it, I, I mean like it, it, when I when I thought sci-fi, the first thing after Star Wars is Alien, and Alien oh, is absolutely uh, horror. Uh, it's, yep, it's, yep. A, it's a horror movie with sci-fi trappings. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, we have eight seconds. So <laughs> okay, gonna sounds good. So uh, we're gonna start a new uh, start a new oh, timer. We're a new one, new one. So we're already kind of getting warmed up on the topic. So new genre is mm. horror. All so, right. So you know. Uh, you this get is, to this is all you. Yeah, so yep, please this leave, this, leave this yeah. discussion. Uh -huh. So yeah, obviously there's lots of different types of horror movies out there. You have supernatural horror, psychological horror, all of that kind of stuff. Thriller kind of falls into this category. Mm. Um, but you have it throughout most of these horror flicks. The idea is, um, I would say, in a weird way, it's kind of comparable to what we've got going on with action flicks, mm. where we have. We are following somebody, mm -hmm. either a singular hero, maybe two, probably not. We all know how this goes, um, <laughs> who is kind of going along their life. And mm -hmm. some sort of disruption comes along, our universal disruption, mm -hmm. the call. And for better or for worse, <laughs> usually what really kicks off a horror movie is when somebody chooses to answer the call rather than ignore it. Actually, so, yeah. <laughs> um. If we want to talk something like Cabin in the Woods, which is, you know, technically spoofy, actually, mm -hmm. um, this it makes fun of this whole premise of all horror movies are built on this idea of people make this transgression. Mm -hmm. Like, there is some spooky shit afoot, mm -hmm. and you are inserting yourself into that spooky shit, and spooky shit kicks off, usually yep. in the form of oh, so much murder, mm -hmm. lots of murder, lots of stalking. Um, there are some situations like, you know, the escape room series oh, where, yeah. you know, you are trapped in a situation mm -hmm. and it's generally very stressful. People usually die yes. sometimes in very gruesome ways. Mm -hmm. And um, so then there's this question of like, who the fuck sits here and watches this? <laughs> uh -huh. What psychopath sits here and watch this, watches this kind of stuff. And the answer is me. I am the psychopath. And I can't, I, I, I've had this discussion <laughs> with people before. Where, because I, this is my shit. Like, the same way that Joe gets hype about superheroes, I get hype about fucking horror. <laughs> and I put this shit on the, on the background. I fall asleep with screams. Brody loves it. You're a monster. <laughs> and um, so there's this question of why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to the, 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 same, the same thing that I've been hitting on. Mm -hmm. This is, this is a, a horror more than I think any other genre, mm -hmm. um, is the empowerment story. Horror almost always starts with a main character mm -hmm. who is absolutely mundane, mm -hmm. who has no special skills, who has no special talents, who is just kind of a person who maybe has a thing or two going for them. Mm -hmm. And they get put in the worst situation you can possibly imagine shoving them into. Mm -hmm. And through that, they grow and overcome that situation. Like, th this is the, the opposite of that, that action story where you're, yeah. you're, you're looking at a person who's already empowered. Mm -hmm. you're, you're seeing a person who is not but finds inside themselves the strength that they need to overcome whatever their bad shit is mm -hmm. and then does it. Um, that's a lot of horror. Oh yeah, especially like um, Final Girl style uh, oh, slasher yeah. horror. Absolutely. Like like 100%. Um, mm -hmm. It was the movie with the games with Samara Weaving not too long ago. Do oh, you remember uh, that one? Uh, oh, um, 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 ready or not? Yeah, ready or not. Yep. Like what, that that no, nails it 100%. Mm -hmm. I, I think the other side of it is you've got horror um, like uh, what are all those um, the, the demon mm -hmm. ones? There's a lot of demons. Oh, like you're yeah. talking like the Conjuring universe? Yeah, the Conjuring oh, universe, okay. absolutely. Um, I, I, I think, I think, I think yeah. those actually hit a lot of the same notes as of 
uh, that, that sci-fi does, oh, okay. where you're not necessarily watching a person overcome a thing, but what you're doing is digging into the stated existence mm-hmm. of the universe that mm-hmm. you're being de- depicted, and kind of running around and, and learning about their um, how the world works from this perspective. So less of a character arc, more of a world building. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Honestly, you know, I'm kind of glad you mentioned that because <laughs> some of the horror movies that I love the most mm. are the ones that have really, really good lore. And I have... Lore. Um, <laughs> and what I really like is <laughs> is this idea for me, especially when we talk about, you know, supernatural things or, you know, serial killer flicks, that kind mm-hmm. of thing, is to me, there is actually there the speculative component to it Mm. because there is this question of what makes a monster Mm. and you know not every horror movie explores this but you know when you hear about where did this ghost come from Mm -hmm. where did this zombie come from this vampire and you Mm -hmm. hear about their origin stories and how they came to be and are currently inflicting terror on people Mm -hmm. and i think that that can be very profound to think about especially when you can see very clear connections between Point A and point B. Mm. Arguably, it's kind of the reason I will never fucking watch The Human Centipede because they do a little bit too good of a job talking about how to get from point A to point B, and that freaks yeah. me the fuck out. So I do actually have my limits, guys. But yeah, so I think it could I think it could be boiled down to having the empowerment story you're talking about, like mm. watching somebody face this great evil or horror and mm. overcoming it, because mm. I think we all can relate to having, you know, personal horrors that we're trying to deal with in our life. Oh, absolutely. There is this, the speculative component, which mm. is understanding the kind of twists and turns and plots that can lead to creating a monster that you could then be facing, um, which in a certain degree adds certain two-dimensionality to some of the monsters we have in our head and in mm. our real life. Mm-hmm. And then um, I think I, I can't remember if this is something I've talked about with Brody or with somebody else. Mm-hmm. But there's this idea that horror movies are also kind of a safe place to explore these feelings of mm-hmm. fear and stuff okay. yeah, in a absolutely. low stakes situation yeah. where yep. like there is not actually a bitch jumping out of your TV screen to fuck you up. Hopefully. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so unless, unless we've got like a ring situation going on. But, um, you know, nobody it, knows they're in a horror movie until something happens. But yeah, it is kind of this place where you can safely explore some of these like more negative feelings and yeah. um I don't know, learn to build up a response to that kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I, um I discovered my fear of snakes from a movie. Yeah, it was snakes on a plane. It was definitely snakes on a plane, right? <laughs> nope. I nope. didn't Anaconda. So. Yeah, that makes sense. That's good. Um the other thing that I, I want to talk about uh specifically with horror is horror is real good at being and you kind of mentioned it, but like a direct allegory. Mm-hmm. Um it is horror allows you to have a truly out there monster Mm. and doing kind of the same thing I talked about with Mm sci-fi comparing showing what is not a human Mm -hmm. by the actions of a thing that is for the most part like near human or 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 like human vampires or a perfect Mm -hmm. example Mm -hmm. um there was the uh, season of American horror story where the vampires were all of the um writers and oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. She, um, she made me watch that one. Yeah, it did make you watch was, that one. It, it's, yep. it's terrible. I hated it. Uh, <laughs> um, but the the idea that art requires mm. um, sacrifice and pain and, oh, and yeah. blood from other people, like the the idea that there is something about our desire to make emotion for other people that causes us to also hurt people Mm -hmm. um is a a really interesting thing to dig into and is not something that is not super uncommon in Mm -hmm. spheres of people who make a lot of things oh yeah um but you can safely talk about that while also just having kind of a cool vampire story with some fun effects and the amount that you engage with it and the amount that you want to dig into Mm -hmm. the the levels of that story and what it says about people in the real world Mm -hmm. um and the amount that the story is enhanced by being willing to do that means that there are people who are, when they want to jump to that level, um, going to enjoy that significantly more, whether or not it's horror is traditionally something that they like or not. That's true. All right. Yeah. Blast Shield's dropping on this one. Uh-oh. It's over now. Timer's off. 
Damn. Okay. Oh, one, wow. I know, okay. that's right. Time goes fast, guys. I think we're going to have time to squeeze in one more good one. Oh, okay. So okay. I'm going to go ahead and drop comedy on the table for this Ooh, one. So okay. we are talking, you know, fucking Monty Python type shit, Life of Brian, um, that kind of thing, parodies, mm. which, again, Cabin in the Woods might ta- kind of falls into that, actually. Yeah. Um, kind of does, actually. But yeah, yeah. so, uh, yeah, so... We talked about some of the motivations that might drive somebody to partake in these different kinds of genres. Mm-hmm. Is there anything deeper for a comedy than you just kind of want to fucking laugh at something? I I would actually say yes. Um, mostly due to the fact of comedy inherently is meant to bring joy. Now, how that joy is elicited varies. Comedy, by, by its nature, is subjective. Now, some people really get their jollies on watching other people suffer. It's it's an entire thing. Oh, God, most of the 2000s comedies were basically that, quite frankly. Um, but inherently, there is the desire to spark joy through laughter. And laughter is usually elicited not just through, like, you know, warm feelings, feeling good, but explicitly eliciting a strong response. Now, how that response is is elicited, that can really vary. Like, I'm even having trouble finding the words, really, to um, find a way to describe it. But ultimately, it's more meant to be a explosive form of joy. Mm-hmm. Might, it might be actually be the way to describe it. I don't know. What do you think, DeRody? Yeah, so there's actually um, – I, I, I read a book about uh, stand-up – a professor who was oh, doing okay. some research into stand-up comedy. Oh, okay. Um, and the definition that he ultimately came for what t- came to for what makes something funny is it's just a subversion of expectations that mm. does so in a way that on the other side of that subversion of expectations you feel comfortable after an anxious situation. Mm. So you talk about things like um, comedy about people being beat up, cringe like, comedy, that kind yeah. of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and what it is is the idea of your going through this situation where something is making you anxious and making you like tense a little bit because oh, yeah, because yeah, something yeah. bad is happening to the dude mm-hmm. and then everything's all right and you can let that anxiety go and let it out. The emotional release after the build up of anxiety. Okay, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um. So that is definitely a place. It's 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 the idea of comedy is very much about releasing mm-hmm. everyday tension and anxiety mm. yeah. um yeah, yeah that's, no, that, that's that's I'm, I, so so when you when you say like is is there a greater <laughs> purpose to to comedy movies than just i don't know making you laugh a little bit like not really mm. but also the goal of making you laugh a little bit is is something that is deeply needed in mm. people mm-hmm. um just like you'll you'll have like the 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 comic relief sidekick mm-hmm. it's to ease the tension when that is getting too high in a in a movie in a scene it's to yeah. to give you a break from the, the the tension of the rest of the movie yep it's the existence of the comic relief in the high tension drama yeah exactly yeah okay but here's what i would put out there yeah is that there are a lot of times where people have used comedy as a tool to talk about big problems in society oh, absolutely. but yeah. i mean it, it, but you know trying to do it through a lens where it makes it a little bit easier to talk about whereas mm-hmm. people might not generally broach the subject at all yep. i know oh, we've yeah. been kind of talking about movies but in mm-hmm. this case i'm thinking about shit like you know fucking saturday night live oh, yeah. and fucking um uh john oliver and stuff like that oh, yeah, so like yeah. the daily show yeah, yeah and yeah. there are a lot of movies that like again are comedy films mm-hmm. but they talk about something kind of big like fucking mm-hmm. um Sorry to bother you. Yes. Like, you know. <laughs> and and uh, comedies are a place where you're going back to character stories. Mm-hmm. You feel tension about what's happening to these characters yep. because they make you care about these characters pretty mm-hmm. deeply very early on in the movie. Oh, yeah. Um, they tend to be charismatic um, charismatic actors who, mm-hmm. who can make you get that connection yeah. very quick so that you're invested in – good things or bad things that are happening happening to them so that yeah. you root for them when they ultimately mm-hmm. triumph in the end um so but you're right uh th- there is absolutely space inside that where uh um sorry to bother you oh, yep. um that is all about like 
you, you like that guy right off the bat. Oh, oh like yeah. Like he's he's working a shitty job. Everybody can relate to to what's happening to him. Um, in in screen. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and and so that that's another place where mm-hmm. you're 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 laughing and feeling the emotion alongside him. Oh yeah. Um, and and you you can relate to the issue that the that the movie is talking about mm-hmm. because you're relating directly to that character. Oh yeah. Everyone wants to be able to, you know, reach a point where they can not have to worry so much about their basic needs and actually be able to express themselves and how they choose to live and all that. Yeah. And the thing of it is, then but but you can also relate to seeing someone else do that by exploiting themselves or someone else and not feeling too great about that. So, like, you can, like you said, you can broach a lot of really uncomfortable topics while also being entertained immensely and laughing your ass off. It's 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 also one of those places where I'll, I'll, I'll circle back around to the idea of these are, are journeys that mm-hmm. are showing you who to be and who not to be. Mm-hmm. Being a person who steps up above a fairly mundane, boring life of being exploited and gains some power and ultimately winds up using that power to to, to right some wrongs mm-hmm. is a thing that we should aspire to. Mm-hmm. Being the dickbag who exploits <laughs> everyone around him mm-hmm. is a thing we should not aspire to. Yes. Um, and and you, you get that idea of like absolute characters mm-hmm. of things that are or, or things or, or people we don't want to see in society. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh! Like, uh, who, who's the one guy in Grandma's Boy? Like the the Ooh. super big nerd who like oh, is, uh, yeah, he talks yeah, yeah. like a robot. And, uh-huh. like, mm-hmm. like, what the fuck is that guy's name? Uh, but yeah, like caricatures of people uh, in uh-huh. real life. Yeah. Uh, uh, the the um, Taika Waititi and Free Guy. Is the oh, other yeah, one that comes absolutely. to my mind right yep, off the bat. Yep, like, yep. like this is the ultimate worst tech bro. Nobody yeah. should want to be like this tech bro. Yeah. Um, and 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 you can you can do that safely by making a funny character mm-hmm. and and. Just having that be the the, the mm-hmm. be a part of the story that you're telling. Oh, yeah, having him fill one of those roles, and in doing so, mm-hmm. you're displaying these are traits we want in society. These are traits we don't want, mm-hmm. and that's why that's why these stories can be so effective. Oh yeah. And then hide it under two hours of <laughs> horse dick jokes. <laughs> yep. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so like so many girl. horse dicks. So many horse dicks. All right, yeah. guys, so we are at the end of the timer okay. for comedy. <laughs> Shit's going fast. Um, so I think we're probably getting close to time at this point. So I'm going to give oh. you all a moment to think of your closing arguments and oh. thoughts on this. <laughs> and in the meantime, okay, I'm going to talk some science. Uh, yeah, so science. it is time this is science. for the Science Minute. I was going to try to find some really interesting fact about, mm. like, animals responses to different kinds of movies to see if they had any kind of genre preferences Mm -hmm. but i didn't have time to figure that out so i'll look that shit up for next time and i'll (laughs) let you know then but for now homies did you know that uh rats can laugh rats have what appear to be a laugh center in their midbrain that is activated when the animals are tickled or when they engage in play behaviors researchers Mm. first discovered that rats could laugh in 2016 after they found tickling the rodents on their belly and back sent them into fits of squeaky giggles. And then they started chasing around the researchers' hands. So, short and sweet. But yeah, you know, if you're curious, go try try tickling a rat. See, awesome. see how it goes. <laughs> oh, Lord. That, that, that turns oh into a whole different horror movie. <laughs> what? No, no rat tickling? What? Oh, no. I, I mean, just... I, I think they already did the, the rat pleasure center experiment. Like this. <laughs> There, there, there's no horror that has not been done by modern science. Oh, no, there is That's not. That's true. Yeah. All right, right, guys. So we're running up on time, but oh, what are okay. some of your closing thoughts as far as these different genres? Mm. Uh, talking about connecting threads, talking about specific things, talking about why your shit is better than everybody else's <laughs> shit. How about, how about you start, Christy? Tell us. Give us your, your, your final horror pitch. My final uh-huh. horror pitch. Okay, my shit is better than everybody else's shit uh-huh. because um, I think that horror films have mm-hmm. the power to offer some interesting vignettes into various cultures. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is through the power of horror that I know way, way too much about the Shinto religion <laughs> and, um, and various other cultures and the mm-hmm. monsters that they face. Mm-hmm. I think it is, it can, it is really, it can be uncomfortable, but I mm-hmm. think it is a good place to practice being in uncomfortable spaces considering uncomfortable situations and how to face them 
And not if you were like a big superhero who had all kinds of powers, but if you were a regular old bitch who really all you had was like a wooden baseball bat. Mm. Like, how can I fight these things in a real way? Mm. These very, very real vampires and mm. other things. Uh-huh. Uh, so, yeah, that's my pitch for why horror is cool and everybody should do it. Go. <laughs> okay, so I'm not going to make a pitch. Um, but I want to tackle one of the things that Joe talked about early on, which was the idea that even though you're looking at demographic information, you're making a pitch for a movie that is like a perfect fit for um, the 20s white dude. Mm. Uh, there are still lots of people who won't respond to that in the same way. Mm. Um, and, and that is because... Everybody is in a different place along their journey journey of from comfort to empowerment, back to comfort, um, back to the the, the new proper. Mm-hmm. And you're you're going to always relate more strongly to protagonists or to scenarios mm-hmm. that are in the same place of that that you are. Mm-hmm. If you're in a place where you're kind of living your regular life and you're a little dissatisfied with it. The idea of getting kicked out of it into something new and exciting Mm -hmm. and challenging is something that you're going to resonate with very strongly. Mm -hmm. If you're in a place where you're in a very comfortable place, Mm -hmm. but you're happy with it, like you're generally happy with your life, Mm -hmm. you're not going to see a movie that encourages you to reach beyond and become more empowered and be Mm -hmm. like, this is a a person that I want to be. This is a person that I think I need to take something from. Um, and, and so the, the, the deeper hits of that story aren't going to resonate with you as well. So I I think when we talk about the idea of not all stories work the same way for the same people, Mm -hmm. it's just because of where you're at in your own personal journey, your own Mm -hmm. personal life. No, I, 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 I couldn't argue that if I wanted to, quite frankly. Um, but, um, I will, I will say like, if I was to create a pitch for, Um, action movies specifically superhero movies is effectively they make that they bridge that gap of fantasy with action because ultimately superhero films are modern myth they are the mythology of the modern era there's no getting around it my friend paula she made that argument years ago yes paula i am finally relenting you were fucking right ultimately Superheroes are the modern myth, and myth ultimately can teach us a variety of things. They can give us hope in a lot of ways that a lot of other stories can't, but they can also kind of also show us what it is we're capable of in the worst ways, like the things that we respond to. And honestly, those are really important things to be able to recognize. And... Let's be honest. Who doesn't want to see a guy wrapped in a flag knock the shit out of a Nazi? So baseball yeah. bat to the <laughs> Babadook. Just saying. God damn the Babadook. That that that's a one with layers. Shit. <laughs> so for yeah. um for action movies especially, mm-hmm. um I've got a buddy Brian and he's got uh, two tattoos and one of them is um Superman with. Uh, the word aspiration. The other one's mm. Batman with the word inspiration. Mm. It's the idea that there are different things you take out of different stories. Oh, yeah. um, but ultimately, they're all trying to teach you how to be a better person. Mm. They're, they're practice for how you want to respond to difficult situations in your own life. Absolutely. And, and, and th- that's, that's why we dig back into them. That's why we come back to the ones mm-hmm. that resonate with us well mm-hmm. because – we need that practice and how to have the fortitude to to move forward to, to mm-hmm. deal with the, the struggles of the everyday. Our problems yeah. problems are not all Ultron, oh, yeah. but our problems are to us in the moment just mm-hmm. as serious and, and and just as difficult. And having, like you said, with the horror stuff, some some safe places to deal with those emotions before mm-hmm. they come up in a, a serious situation. Absolutely, is is vital for growth as people. And honestly, that applies to any genre of fiction, really. Yeah. Because you can gain so much inspiration from any of them, from any protagonist of any of any story, because they're that's who we relate to. That's how we learn of the story. Like, yeah, 
sometimes a lot of times I'll ask, what would Sam Wilson do in this? What would Steve Rogers do in this? I mean, I, I'm not sure I'd really want to know what would Kerry do in this situation, but you know what? We saw what Kerry would do in certain situations. My kind of approach to a situation. Sometimes Ex- you just got to burn a bitch down. <laughs> exactly. But that, but that's but that's the thing. And ultimately, fiction in general, I, I think your buddy's uh, tattoo really ties in well. There's aspirations and inspirations, and we can really, any story can carry us where carry us to a point where we figure out exactly who the fuck we are and want to be. And that's why stories are great. Reading is fundamental. Go to your local cinema. (laughs) Also your local library. Yes. Uh, Joe would like us to wrap the fuck up. So Mm -hmm. other Joe, would you like to wrap us the fuck up? Oh, I do believe I am capable of doing such a thing. So Brody. You brought us some uh, very, very interesting insight today, Mr. Mumbles, and I greatly appreciate it. I uh, I really like stories, so mm-hmm. it was my pleasure to sit and talk about some of what makes um, stories and storytelling really, really deep and interesting. Huzzah. Also, for those that didn't know, Brody's also our DM in our Dungeons & Dragons campaign, so that ties into things. I really like stories, in case I didn't mention it before. <laughs> yes. So... That was Mr. Mumbles. <laughs> and, of course, there was our scientist supreme, Christine Kitchens. Always happy to threaten with a timer. <laughs> how, how so much like someone to threaten you with time? I was almost about to get real like, accidentally sexist, but I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> oh, I'll say you want to end this uh, podcast with me throwing this mic across the room. All right, I'll be- I, like I said, I almost did it. Right, I did not. All right, I, I think I think let's wrap it up. Let's uh-huh. wrap it up. I think throw the monster. You'll do more property damage when it gets all over the electronics. Yeah, but then there's videos proving I didn't do it, and I was your Simp Master Thirst King, Joe Kane. Now get the fuck out. Fucking right. Bye, guys. <laughs>